he heard the creature breathing heavily. The Sasquatch screamed, obviously, and uh, took off into the woods. And he remembers, he said, I could not believe how fast it moved, how it went from this point in the woods to that point in the woods. We're camping outside of Packwood, Washington, a known area for Sasquatch encounters. In this video, we will share some local stories, as well as give some tips on finding Sasquatch evidence. We are with Kirk Brandenburg, James Washburn, and Nick Bell, members of the BFRO. The Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization compiles reports, and their members investigate these reports. We've asked them to show us what they look for when looking for Sasquatch. So right now we're doing a road walk. Um, the road is nice and soft right now. So basically looking for prints right now, some tracks. Um, like I said, the substrate's really great for that right now. So we're just gonna kind of walk and see what we see. What's the difference between a human print and a Sasquatch print? So I guess the obvious first thing is gonna be the size, um, not just the length, but also the width and the fact that it's predominantly more of a flat foot you're not going to have that pronounced human arch in the middle um, so that's going to be the main thing we're looking for if we're lucky we'll get some dermal ridges uh, toe prints basically what are dermal ridges uh, basically like a fingerprint um, it's, it's the ridge in the dermis the skin so the toes have it the same way your fingers do are you aware of any sasquatch prints that have those oh yes there definitely are some that have those um, Oh, gosh, I can't remember his there. There's a researcher. I cannot remember his name. He is an uh, I believe I want to say he's either ex cop or ex FBI and he's done a lot of work with uh, dermal ridges Basically proving that the prints they have can't be faked uh, I, I guess unless you knew how to fake a dermal ridge in a footprint, but that seems highly unlikely Are Sasquatch toes different from human toes? um, so Yes and no. I mean, just like people, there's different morphology in, in, in Bigfoot toes, so they're not all the same. Um, like I said, just like people, some are going to be more straight across from big toe to little toe. Some are going to be more slanted. So I don't know that there's much difference. This play is definitely going to be a little wider. Um, as your foot hits the ground when you're barefoot, your toes will spread out. They'll grip the ground. Uh, not something you would generally see in a, in a human print. Most humans when they go barefoot, aren't used to it. So you walk more gingerly. You're not gonna have the, the huge gait that, that a Sasquatch will have. You're definitely not gonna have the big impression. It's not gonna go as deep as, as a heavier, you know, six to 800 pound biped would do. So in a lot of reports, you'll notice that Sasquatch prints are in a straight line and that is, some will call it tight rope walking, but it actually is also a mountaineering technique. Walking in, in snow and in loose substrate. Um, and the gate's going to be obviously massive. I mean, my gate is probably two feet. Um, you're looking at a, a four, five foot gate for a Sasquatch. Something that I could do if I was bounding. But bounding is not something I don't think a human would want to do barefoot because you never know what you're going to land on. If you look on this road, the, the, the road isn't going to be receptive to any kind of track, but really anything off to the side, um, a big muddy spot, uh, dirt, um, really anything that's squishy enough that can take a form um, that we could cast later if it's good. Uh, other than that, um, we could look at trees, um, signs of any animal would be worth checking out. Um, if it looks like a bear might have scratched up something. If there's bears, there's food. So if we see a big berry patch, maybe go back there, see if we can find something that might look like fur or uh, any signs of disturbed um, uh, vegetation. So by doing that, um, that's typically how we'll go about. We aren't, we aren't hunting Bigfoot out here. Um, we're just looking for sign and then a lot of the time we're trying to be interesting enough that they, if they're in the area, they come and elicit an interaction with us. 
Um, you aren't, we aren't going to go out there in ghillie suits and find a Bigfoot. I mean, I like that. <laughs> so um, a lot of times what we're doing out here is we'll bring um, instruments, uh, harmonicas, flutes. Uh, one time a guy had a bagpipe, uh, didgeridoos, things that are weird, things that aren't in the woods. Because if these target creatures, you know, Sasquatch or apes or hominids, apes are curious, just like us. Um, they'll go and investigate. The, the, if something's entertaining, they'll watch. We kind of want to be the circus, you know, so we, we do a lot of weird things. Um, and the evidence kind of just comes along with that. While we're out here trying to elicit an interaction, we have uh, thermal imaging. So we are, um, while someone's playing the bagpipes, there's a group of us up on a ridge or down the road with a thermal monocular um, scouting out the area, seeing if something is trying to get closer. Uh, we have audio recorders placed around the perimeter of wherever we're camped. Um, sometimes long term, sometimes just overnight, but any noises, uh, a wood knock, a howl, a whoop, um, anything that might be out of place. So a thermal imaging camera is uh, similar to night vision, except it doesn't utilize infrared. So when you look through a thermal imager, um, they typically have different settings. So if something's hot in the woods, it'll stand out. You'll see the um, ambient temperature of trees, of rocks, of the vegetation. And then um, if a deer would walk across the road, a thermal imager is really nice because it you can be in complete darkness and clearly see whatever that creature is moving across the road so typically if we're if we're going to look for a sasquatch we want to have an environment that can support a large potentially omnivorous uh, primate or mammal um, so this sort of terrain is perfect uh, where you have all these mossy mosses and lichens you have plenty of vegetation plenty of coverage um, there is a correlation between uh, rainfall and Sasquatch activity. So anywhere that it rains a lot and it's temperate, just like here. Um, majority of reports are from areas just like this one, all up the Pacific Northwest. Um, and when we get here, this sort of sandy bar, um, anything soft and squishy that can receive an impression and a track, um, this is sort of the ideal terrain. Bodies of water, uh, lots of moss, lots of lichen, lots of food sources. Um, just think of what you would want if you were stuck in the woods by yourself, and that's probably what they want as well. Shelter, food, water. So, um, And in this area, I mean, Pacific Northwest, tons of volcanoes. There's lava tubes, there's caves, there's plenty of places for critters to hide and have shelter. All right, so here is just an example um, of one thing we can do for getting prints. This is obviously not a Sasquatch print. This is canine. Um, I can't tell if it's a, a dog, coyote, wolf. Could be any of it. it does, it's irrelevant to this. Um, but depending on what kind of phone you have, if you're an iPhone user, um, if your newer iPhones have what's called a time of flight sensor, which is LiDAR, you can download LiDAR programs. If you're an Android user, like I am, you don't have that. But there are programs like the one I use called WIDAR, which is W-I-D-A-R. And basically what you will do is you get down here to your, your subject and it just takes lots of little pictures, right? And you just move around. And what'll happen, I can't do it here. We're out in the woods. I have no internet or data but what it will do is you will upload it to a server it'll save in your phone so you don't have to worry about that but you upload it to their server and then their computer will stitch it together into a 3d model um, i can show you one here that i did of my dog's footprint in my garden at home and you can see you can go all the way around in 3d you can see the bottom. You can get to the toe pads in the bottom. And I, this is just a really great tool to have. Um, it's a nice alternative to casting. It's obviously super light. Everybody has their phone. Everybody wants to take pictures when they're out in the woods. So even if you're not out looking for a Sasquatch prints like we do, you probably will have your phone to take pictures. So it, this is a great way to do it. I think it shows more detail than a, a cast. It's my personal opinion. It also helps document the area a little bit better. You can see where each individual twig was, where each pebble was, where the rocks were, um, what the substrate looked like. So it's more of a record than what you get from a cast that you pull out of a drawer that was cast 20 years ago. You don't necessarily know 
what the surroundings look like and what where where a rock was was something that looks like a toe maybe it wasn't a toe it could have been a rock so i, I think just the, the 3d scanning to me is is the way to go okay um another thing we look for whenever we come out here is you know um clean running water uh, you don't a lot of animals won't eat out of or drink out of uh anything stagnant like a swamp or a you know uh, anything standing water we don't really pay too much attention to but the shores of creeks rivers streams um, anything flowing uh, this is what animals prefer and a lot of uh, tracks and impressions we find are along creeks just like this one um, a lot also a lot of sightings are here a lot of people come they'll do gold panning any you know they'll be looking down they aren't aware so um, it might feel more com a sasquatch might feel more comfortable observing somebody who isn't obviously looking for anything um, so a lot of river um, activities fishing that sort of thing <laughs> we picked this spot is mainly because of the topography um, there's a creek close by good clean running water uh, some hills which is part of the the high castle theory where, where you're gonna have potential Sasquatch maybe up high looking down is a safety zone for them all right so right now we are getting ready to head up the road do a night walk hopefully grab some attention of a Sasquatch, maybe bring him into the camp for the night. We'll see what happens. A lot of researchers like to take night walks away from camp. Sometimes this can elicit response, but if you prefer to stay in camp, you might find yourself to be the lucky one. As curious as the Sasquatch are, they just can't help but to come in and peep along the perimeter of camp. Just make sure you have your thermal camera ready. Here's a look at some of the gear we use, um, starting over this direction. We have some audio recorders. Um, this is an external battery pack. I think this is a 20,000 yep, milliamps, 20, so this will last days and days. Uh, this is an Olympus. Uh, this one here, that one is Nick's. This one here is mine. Also, I run it off of bus power. Uh, this is a Tascam. This is a little bit uh, higher end, I believe, than the yeah. Olympus. Uh, but you, you can't go wrong with the Olympus or a Sony. Yep. You, you don't have to spend a lot of money to, to get into this. Um, you can get a cheap $20 audio recorder. So the, the, the way we kind of have these set up is um, so we can leave them out overnight. Um, so what we got is either kind of a hard shell case or what we started using is these um, faucet bags. So they're waterproof, slightly insulated. Um, you can kind of gear up everything and put it somewhere in the woods and it'll keep any water out and it'll keep the devices from getting too cold. Um, a little tricky in the winter, but in the summer. And so you kind of have this little sack and this is just a little microphone that we can hook on a tree branch while this is kind of buried under some foliage so it's not as visible. Um, and then we have some thermal imagers. This one's mine. Um, I know a lot of people who are kind of getting into this hobby look at thermal imagers and they're, you know, two, four, five thousand dollars um, This one was about $500 and I think it does 360 um, pixels, I forget, by 256. So it's not high quality by any means, but it gets the job done um, if you're just carrying around. You want to talk about yours? Sure. And this one, uh, this is an ATN uh, OTS. Uh, this one is a 640 by 480, so it's a little uh, higher image quality than that. This one, uh, this specific model, I can get 16 hours of footage, so I can run this overnight, um, which I have found is is the best way to do it. Just It'll take up to a 64 gigabyte memory card, and I can get, yeah, I can record out in the woods with an external battery for four to five days. 
And then over here, this is this is small, but this is very affordable. This is just a night vision camera. Um, it just uses infrared and you can view it on this little screen. Just hold it in front of you and, and watch the screen as you're going. And these are affordable. You can get these at Best Buy, I believe, for maybe just around $100, $120. And one thing I forgot with going back to the audio was that um, during our walks today um, around the woods, I always had this um, little microphone sticking out. So this is just a cheap, I think these are 40 bucks on Amazon. Um, just a cheap little Sony camera that I'll carry you around whenever we're walking through the woods. Re uh, audio recorder. Audio recorder, sorry. <laughs> that um, we'll just pick up anything if we hear uh, a wood knock or rock clack or any kind of vocalization. Um, a lot of times when you're just walking through the woods, you'll hear stuff and it's good to have it and uh, not need it and then need it and not have it. Right, so, and, and we don't need to relegate, it's not relegated to just nighttime use. Um, that's the beauty of the thermal camera is you can use them in the daytime as well. They work just exactly the same in the daytime as they do the nighttime since they are reliant on heat and not light. What's your favorite report from this area? Okay, um, there's a report that came into the BFRO that I investigated, uh, but it's not part of the public database because um, some things that happened in the report, which I'll explain, but it's my favorite report from this area. It was a fellow who, uh, he was having a hard time in his life and he was frustrated and he decided I'm going to head up to the spot he and his family like to hang out in the woods. And in the middle of the night he threw his gear in his truck and he drove up to the trailhead and he started hiking. So he's hiking on the trail that he's familiar with in the dark and suddenly something started circling him as he was hiking in the trail. And it was really weirding him out and so he decided uh, I need to hike faster. And as he was hiking up to the lake, he heard something behind him and he had a headlamp on and he whipped around and he just caught like a leg diving into the underbrush. And it was hard, he couldn't see anything because there's such thick underbrush that the trail was going through. And so this had never happened to him before. And uh, so he hurried up, got up to the lake put his back against a boulder and sat there ready to defend himself if anything happened. As soon as it was light, he got out of there, hiked back down and took off, went down and told a friend. And his friend said, BS, that didn't happen. So he said, come with me tonight. And so the two of them went up the trail again that night, That's the second night. And as they were hiking up, it happened again. Something started circling them in the woods as they were on the trail in the dark at night and uh, but they didn't stay that time they didn't hike all the way to the lake they turned around went back down and told a third friend third friend said bs that didn't happen and they said come with us tonight <laughs> so the report submitter and the third friend went up the third night in a row same spot, it happened again. Something was circling them in the woods. But this time they went up, they were armed. And uh, the, uh, the report submitter and his friend, they decided instead of retreating or powering onto the lake, they decided they were going to sit there and, and sit down in the trail back to back. So they sat down in the trail on the ground back to back with this thing moving in the woods around them um, and it kept getting closer and closer and next thing the report submitter knew is that he heard the creature breathing heavily and it was pitch black they couldn't see anything they didn't have their headlamps on they were just sitting there in the dark heavy tree canopy cloud cover and so they could not see anything it, the breathing came closer, very large lunged breathing. It was a large animal. And then he could feel the breath on his face. That's when he couldn't take it anymore. And they had gone up that time armed, and he took his weapon and fired at the whatever was breathing on him out of self-defense, out of fear for his life. He didn't go up there to harm this animal. He didn't go up there to kill it. He was defending himself. 
but because of the harm that was uh, the, the gunfire, the possible harm to the Bigfoot, the report never was published. But um, after he fired, the Sasquatch screamed, obviously, <laughs> and uh, took off into the woods. And he remembers, he said, I could not believe how fast it moved how it went from this point in the woods to that point in the woods. It's, nothing can move that fast. And it was screaming the whole way. Obviously, we don't know whatever happened to that Sasquatch, but uh, he was convinced that it was a Sasquatch because he saw a primate leg, and it happened three nights in a row. The behavior, he said, he's very familiar with the woods. It wasn't like any other known animal that he's ever encountered. And... Um, he has family members who have had encounters in that location as well. But uh, that's one of my, uh, my favorite report from this area. It's, it's fascinating. And I want to again emphasize that he didn't intend to harm the creature, but he was fear in fear for his own life. Another report from this area involves a sighting by a family of five. They were heading east on Highway 12, and just as they were passing Forest Road 46, they saw a Sasquatch standing on the side of the road. They passed it going 60 miles an hour and quickly flipped a U-turn after a car passed by. The kids were in the back of the car screaming and yelling when they came upon the Sasquatch again. The female passenger said it was swaying back and forth. It covered its eyes as if blinded by the light. The car in front of them had slammed on its brakes, then carried on. The Sasquatch gave them a good look as it walked up a hill. It was roughly six foot six, covered in reddish-brown hair. The hair was about three inches long, with the exception of longer hair on the back. Some researchers use red lights or red headlamps when looking for Sasquatch. We personally do not believe this to work. The Sasquatch always have the upper hand. Using a red light only looks like a military operation, while regular white lights are what they know us humans to use. Jonathan has shined a bright flashlight in their face two times, and they never stopped coming around. Something you should know about Packwood is that it is elk country. They crowd the streets of the small town during hunting season. You can get fairly close to them, though I would not recommend it. The elk are everywhere in Packwood, a plentiful food resource for the Sasquatch. I want to say 20 plus years ago, I was in this area going on a camping trip, uh, me and my girlfriend at the time. Um, this was a spot that we had stopped. Obviously, you can see the Forest Service has closed this down and uh, it's kind of dilapidated. I believe it's just a, a rest facility. Um, it's kind of neat to see it again after all these years. It's been so long since I've been in here. Uh, but on that trip, we ended up turning off onto a forest road, just trying to find some dispersed camping. A long story short, it ended up for whatever reason, it had the area had the creepiest feel. It just, it was a, a creepy feel. We ended up just kind of, kind of heading to bed early because we, you know, neither one of us were very good on where we were. We were both uneasy. Late in the night, early in the morning, the car alarm on our blazer gets chirped. Something bumped against it. Um, Bigfoot. I don't know, something big enough to set it off. But an hour later, two, three o'clock in the morning, off in the distance, maybe a mile, I hear the loudest roar, like, like something, a, a T-Rex roar. And I couldn't, I couldn't quantify it in my head what it was. I, I it was just going over, is this a bear? No, bears don't do that. Is this an elk? No, elk don't make that noise. Deer don't make that noise. Mountain lions do not make that noise. Um, I kind of was freaked out. As soon as the sun came up, as soon as the sun came up, we packed up and left. Um, I've always kind of kept that in the back of my head. Just kind of threw it down. I never wanted to say it was Bigfoot. I don't want to be that guy where everything's Bigfoot. But as the years go on and, and I look back at that story, and the more I've researched and the more I've been out, I honestly don't know what else it could have been. Matt Moneymaker is the man that founded the BFRO. We once heard him say, look for the cedar swamps. We couldn't agree more. 
There's a spot that's about a half mile from our property. We have singled it out as a very important location for the Sasquatch. It is completely surrounded by cedar trees in swampy terrain. Perhaps it's the mosquito-repelling oil within the trees that draws them. Another thing people uh, may not realize or, or think about is that you don't have to go into the middle of nowhere. Is it fun? Yeah. Um, is it exciting? Of course. But it's not necessary. As Everyone likes see, an adventure. Yeah, for sure. And you can see we're walking on a paved road. This is a forest service road. It's easy to get to. Any car can get on this. Um, whether you have a Prius or, or a, a Forerunner, you can drive this road. Yeah. There's no need to go to the ends of the earth to find um, kind of the target creature we're looking for. Um, I mean, I know both James and myself, we work nine to fives, we have families, um, we get out when we can. You know, we don't, this isn't our job or anything, it's just a passionate hobby, something that we enjoy doing, coming out and um, looking forward with our other friends. So and there are plenty of active theories that Sasquatch live and work on the outskirts of society, the fringes. They're, they are potentially curious about what's going on with people. Um, people are humans are also a huge resource um, nutritionally. We have tons of waste product, waste food that gets thrown away. Let's come over here and make the car coming. Yeah. So between potential curiosity and just, like I said, to be used as a resource, being on the fringes of a human human society, of cities and towns makes a lot of sense biologically. I mean, this, for some reason you see bears and dumpsters and deers in people's yards. It's a, it's a ready, easy resource. Um, another reason we come out here, we um, areas not so remote, is uh, James and I are organizing um, an expedition for the BFRO this August, and um, they're open to campers and people of all skill levels. So we want to find locations that are adventurous. So um, seasoned outdoorsmen come out and they gain something from the experience, gain some knowledge and some friends. And people new to the hobby, new to camping, you know, maybe they go camping once a year, um, they still be, deserve to have an opportunity to come out with us and uh, learn about Sasquatch and what we do and why we do it. So, um, so accessibility becomes important. Right. And of course, I mean, we go out, we'll go on backpacking trips, we go on kayaking trips. Um, we definitely do those more remote uh, excursions but they're a bit more few and far between. Um, it's always nice just to be able to drive two hours from your house and be in the woods and um, try and elicit some sort of interaction if they're in the area. What do you have planned for the upcoming one? Okay, so first night, uh, the idea is to kind of get a gist of the occupant or the participants yep. to see, you know, physical fitness or whatever. I want to get a small group of people together to do an overnight backpacking trip up to a close by ghost town where we're gonna uh, just set up overnight um, just audio obviously and therming yeah. maybe make some noises but really just observe it, it's since the area is so much more remote than than the rest of the area we're gonna be yeah and then the other nights I mean we'll do typical um, night hikes you know up and down the, the road maybe try and find some trails do that um, I want to take the group to the the Grove of the Giants or what's it called um, I think that's it. Yep. Yeah. yeah, but there's a nice old growth forest we want to take some people to, do some noises, and like you said, like make some ruckus and then calm down and see if something comes in. Um, we'll do a movie night. We're going to take, uh, watch Legend of Boggy Creek most likely and kind of go into the woods and set up a projector and a screen. And then the uh, investigators will have thermals and we'll be therming around the area while whoever wants to watch the movie can watch the movie. And, right. and, the, and the movie night yeah. might even be multiple nights, depending. Yeah. It may be a main base camp activity for people who maybe aren't physically able to get up yeah. or even want to do the night hikes. Just make sure you don't show a movie where the Bigfoot kills people. <laughs> don't give them any ideas. Yeah. That's, that's the best part. <laughs> <laughs> so how do people sign up? Uh, the BFRO website's the best place. There's a whole page for it. Just um, contact the email and the mm -hmm. BFRO secretary will... Yep. Just click on yeah. click on the Washington Expeditions and this will be the August Expedition. Yep. There is another Washington Expedition in July which also will be, uh, be a good expedition. Yep. Uh, Missy and Alan are awesome. Yeah. Um, it'll be a little bit targeted, a little bit different than ours, but I think it would still be a good time. Yeah. Though many of us conduct our research differently, we are all looking to uncover the greatest mystery in the woods. Once you yourself has an encounter, 
you'll most likely understand why we search. Stay safe out there. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.